um, the first session, which um, is is now, um, is going to be on Stoic books. Um, so books that have been published in the last 12 months um, by people involved in modern Stoicism or who are working with Stoic ideas, or we're going to hear a Stoic uh, reading of a classic novel, of course, by Ernst Hemingway from Mass. Um, and then we're going to have a, a public discussion, I guess. Um, there's going to be some sort of interview about it. We want to hear a little bit more from you and discuss um, what Stoicism might mean for you and, um, and also uh, possible ways forward for, for building um, community groups for those interested. Um, but we'll get to that uh, in due course. For the, for the moment, uh, it, gives me, it gives me great pleasure to invite um, Lynn Vu, um, who is a Melbourne entrepreneur who's also involved in the Melbourne Stoic. Um, which is Roger's group. And Lynn's going to be talking about um, a book by Kai Whiting and Leonidas Konstantakos. And the book is, uh, as we'll hear, Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living in. So, Lynn. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lynn, and um, my professional background in mathematics and computer science has nothing to do with philosophy. And uh, now, my husband and I run a, a company in construction and property development, and thus has very little to do with philosophy either. So, I um, discover stoicism in the phase in my life where I was looking for more spiritual growth, and um, I found that. Stoic principle uh, are very in line with what I believe um, what a good life should be and what a good person should be. Um, and I have found that um, by practicing Stoic uh, Stoicism, uh, it has helped me a lot in my personal growth in um, building relationship with other people and also in my business life. So today I'm going to uh, review this book, Being Better, Stoicism for World Worth Living In. Um, it was published April last year, and it has uh, received raving reviews from the community of both long-term Stoic and also people who are new to the uh, philosophy. And um, it is a, a very short read, as you can see, um, but it's, it's packed with many golden nuggets. And I can find quotes and interpretation of Stoicism in this book that I can print out and make little poster and hang around the house. Um, so if maybe I can capture your interest by reading out some quotes from, uh, from here. So in this chapter about realizing luck, um, you will succeed not just or necessarily because you are more talented than someone, but because you are doing all you can to push the odds in your favor. Now, in the same chapter, it uh, explained the Asian Stoic belief that nothing is truly random, but rather the unfolding of cause and effect as part of the natural order of things. So in another chapter about know what's in your control and what isn't, um, talking about Tato the Younger, who is a Roman senator, and he slept on the ground with his soldier, were what they were, ate what they ate, refused to ride on horseback, marching alongside with them. The quote is, his comfort lay in not material pleasures, but in the wisdom that he gained. There was a mentioning earlier in the panel discussion about uh, practicing voluntary discomfort. I guess, um, I, and, and Roger looked at me and, and sort of smiled because we discussed the topic of cold shower before. Uh, so I guess the, the definition of discomfort is, is depends on, on you and, and your thinking and what's considered discomfort. Um, so, for example, what is considered comfortable sitting at home on you know, Saturday watching telly on your comfy sofa or sitting on that chair for, what, seven, eight hours and be here and, and, and find comfort in knowing that you're gaining some new knowledge. Um, or, for example, I think we, we, we're here on this earth, we're blessed with this body, but a lot of time we forget that we, you know, we can experience life through sensations. And walking your barefoot on the rough surface 
is that really discomfort or is or awakening your senses when was the last time you feel something in the palm of your feet and so and and cold shower yeah, that's that's few moments of, of physical discomfort but the thing that i gain from it is tremendous mental strength so whether you define that discomfort it is all up to you and um Another quote I found interesting is um, virtue is not self-proclaimed, but rather demonstrate through mindset and actions. So the book starts with the chapter on the promise of the good life. And the Greek term um, eudaimonia referred to the state of flourishing, fulfillment, and well-being. And um, it's a promise that the good life is possible to anyone, regardless of your ethnicity, your educational level, your background, uh, your social status, or any life situation. So this book is a uh, you know, contemporary version of Stoicism, and for anyone who believes that they could live a good life and willing to put the work in it, in achieving it. So as mentioned in the session with Boca, sometimes one could feel intimidated by a book, either because of the, the language or the complexity or the length or all of those. And if you are new to Stoicism and you were reading some of the classic Stoic texts and you might find it a bit overwhelming or even you know, put off by it, this is the this is a one to, to try. It, it covers both the fundamentals and also the extension, the discussion on how we find answer to some of the um, moral questions that we face in, in, in these days. So um, there, there must be a clear distinction between being better and feeling better. And the and stoicism will be the tool that help you to develop the critical thinking and the moral accountability to, to distinguish between these two. Um, so I'm We'll quickly read out the first part of um, in the in, in the first chapter that it's cover the overview about stoicism that I, I found you know it's always even as a long time story it's always good to go back to these um, fundamentals um, so stoicism is a practical philosophy that provides an antidote to troubled times um, it keeps our ego and excess in check when things are going well. And um, Stoicism helps us understand ourselves and other people um, and navigate the path to life challenges and success. It doesn't give you, you know, it doesn't remove all the life obstacles, but it helps us to think differently about them. It won't give us, provide us with all the answers, but it does the ability to form the questions that ultimately lead to the solutions. So in, in subsequent chapters, the book dive deep into what it means to live virtuously and discuss many examples, um, both you know, famous and lesser known Asian Stoic, and uh, as well as some modern figures. Um, if you're familiar with the exercise, the Stoic exercise for contemplation at the stage, uh, you would find these figures in, in exemplary stories very useful in fighting a sage for your difficult situation. So contemplation, contemplation of the sage is um, when facing with a life ch challenge or a, a, a difficult situation. Let's make sure. Right, someone gives you coffee in the middle of the speech. That's <laughs> 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 And you demonstrated the principle tremendously well. Uh, so I was saying, oh yes, contemplation of the stage. Yes. So if if somebody at work make a sarcastic comment, and only if you can pause and you know even close your eyes and think, what would a sage do or say in this situation? But if it's not practical or even possible to think up with the answer during that heated moment then um, you need to do the exercise of, uh, you know, in the morning or meditation of the evil, where you will need to think about, okay, I know this college, I know that it is possible that he or she is going to make a sarcastic comment, 
uh, today and what I am going to do or, or, or say something about that at that moment. And sometimes if you can't come up with the answer yourself, that is when you can refer to a sage or, or example of somebody who um, you admire or you know that have built up the characters and the strengths. And you can think about, okay, what would this person do in this case? So this book has plenty of great examples uh, because I was sometimes in, in practicing contemplation of the sage, sometimes I do find it difficult to, to find the people that I can refer to to think, well, what would this person do? But um, this made me think. And um, yes, and oh yes, interesting story about um, Alex Zadini. So in this chapter about what's in your control and what's not in your control, uh, this one here, is about the Italian Formula One and North American champion um, car racing. His, his name is Alex Zarini and he was a world champion in, uh, from 1997 to 1999. And then when he came back to race in uh, 2000, um, you know, some odd turns and ill-fated turn that he actually came last and then he was out of job for two seasons. Um, but if you think that was unfortunate, now listen to this part. Um, so when he came back in 2001 and he was in this um, race that, I'm going to read out because this is very cool. Um, on existing the pit and rejoining the race circus, Zanadi's wheel slid on the patch of grass, spinning the car moment, momentarily into a weird angle and putting his body in a direct risk of being hit by an oncoming car. Indeed, um, a car plowed straight into him at the speed of more than 200 miles per hour. And his car was literally torn into two and his leg was severe from his body. It was a freak accident, an act of the gods. No one else had ever been struck in that way. And by the time the rescue team got Zadini out of the cockpit, he was down to one liter of blood. His heart stopped seven times. The hospital staff put him in a medically induced coma in the scan hope that this would protect his broken body from organ failure. The odds were stuck against him. No one has ever survived a motor racing accident that severe. Unlucky was an under understatement. So, once the worst was over and the pain relieving medic medication has been reduced to the level where he could begin to think, what do you think a normal person would think? Um, most of us, many of us, I should say, you know, could spend time dwelling on the fact of how unlucky I am, what a freak accident it was. Uh, and being a stoic, Zadini asked himself a difficult question. How will I do all the things I still want to do without my legs? So it's a framing of the thoughts. And there's a lot more after this about how interesting life he lived afterwards, after the incident, and applying you know, stoic principle and still can have a good life regardless of what life situation it is. Um, but you know, it does not have to wait for the extreme unfortunate, unfortunate event to apply stoic principle. It is the, the everyday little things that make us practice stoic principle and, you know, become a better version of ourselves and be ready at whatever lives throw at us. So in this book, um, Kai and Leo talk a lot about the practical example in their own daily challenges, which is what I really like about the book. Um, for example, Kai and Leo don't drink dairy milk. Some of it is to do with the concern for the animals and how the dairy industry have violated the animal welfare and focused only on profit. Now, it's easy for them to make a personal choice of what milk product to use. But when it's come to other people, how do they, how does this play out? So uh, if they go to someone else's house where they offer a cup of tea with milk in it, what would they do? Accept the cup of milk, uh, sorry, cup of tea with milk they already made or refuse? Um, is it now the right time to talk about the opinion about the dairy industry? 
or whether is the other person, you know, in the position or even interested in hearing the opinion at the time. So uh, this is where it, it's, the, it's the everyday decision that, that prepare yourself for much more difficult situations that you might face in life. Um, so there's more in here. I don't want to give out too much spoilers. Um, and um, there's another uh, very interesting story about what's in your control and not, what's not in your control. So as you might be familiar with the famous example uh, of uh, the conversation between Cicero and Cato the Younger about the, the archery. So the, um, the archers who take aim at a target and let the arrow flies. Whether the arrow hits the target, does not matter? So as long as the archer has made the best attempt, um, whether the arrow hit the target, it, it should be a, a preferred indifference. So that means their happiness should not rest on it. All right. So this story here is about two almost identical archers who stood in almost the same spot with the same bow and the same strength of conviction, yet achieved vastly different results. So one is Rosa Parks and the other one is Claudette Corbin. Um, so Claudette Corbin actually is the first one in the history that refused to obey the uh, segregation policy where it's mandated that a colored person must give up a seat to a white person. So she refused to give up her seat to a white woman and she was physically dragged from the bus, arrested and fined. Um, but only a few months after that, it was Rosa Park who also stood up to not giving up seat. And she, uh, it, it was Park who obtained fame and acclaim uh, for having set the wheels of desegregation in motion. Uh, and the US Congress honored her as the first lady of civil rights and the mother of freedom of movement. So if we refer back to the stoic um, archery analogy, you could say that Park hit the target while Corbyn missed it through no fault of her own. And however, aiming for excellence, both women did the right thing and their action was equally virtuous. Um, and so there are, you know, this, this day I um, listen to a lot of audio books and usually if I find it's a good book and something that I want to read again, I would physically order the, order the physical book in. And uh, there's some books that I go through maybe in one weekend or even one sitting and some other books that take me a, a long time to finish. And uh, one of them is called um, Simplicity, How to Live More with Less by Dominique Laurel. She's French and she lived in Japan for a long time. So her book is a combination of wisdom from both the West and the East. Um, so that one, it's, it's been more than two years and I'm only halfway through it. And it's also a very short read, it's even shorter than this one. And if it wasn't for the task that I have to review this book at uh, Melbourne Stoic Connects, this is the book that I would like to take a lot longer to read, probably six months to a year. There are some wonderful thought provoking questions at the end of each chapter that I found that even I haven't got the answer for them. Um, so I usually like to ponder on the chapter and especially in this case those questions before I move on to the next one. So uh, yes, it, it, it is great and I think it, um, it also, I have a little library at home where I only keep the books that, um, you know, I, I hope that my children would um, accidentally discover at moments of boredom or out of curiosity. So if, I think that if, if Stoic principle, you know, 2000 years ago, uh, these days are still very applicable. I'm pretty sure that the example and the story in this book are still relevant in 20 years time when my children come back and visit me and pick up the book from the bookshelf. So uh, yes, well, thank you for your attention and I hope you have been.
Thank you so much, Tim. Our next uh, presenter is Maximus Parker. He's from Alabama originally. He's now uh, a National Business Services Manager down under, of course. He's also uh, a photographer of note. Um, but today, Maximus is going to be talking about Ernst Hemingway's classic work, The Old Man and the Sea, from a Stoic perspective. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Okay. Um, in full disclosure, I lost my voice yesterday, so I'm going to have to practice some Stoic principles and really push to this. <laughs> and um, you guys also did something with me and listened to this very great classic voice. So I guess for context, since 2019, I've set a goal for myself to read at least one book a week, that with the goal being 52 books per year. Um, right now, I'm on 241 books, the book that I'm currently reading being Cossacks by Tolstoy, which is, you know, I'm actually enjoying. Um, I ran into this little book in the midst of me reading things like Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, uh, Cormac McCarthy, Anne Rand, like these giant novels, and I'll take a break and I read like a little novella. I ran into a little book, The Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. And during the, it's a very simple book and concept, but I guess because I'm constantly reading, constantly changing my perspective, the way I see things, the way I interpret things are a little different. And I try to delve deeper in them and really try to get like, my own meaning from it or see what I can inject or extract that might not be something that you could just Google or type and kind of get from that. And obviously the stoicism impacted me. That's probably why I view this book in this particular way. So it's technically pretty simple. The book is about this old man, Santiago. Um, he's down on his luck. He hasn't caught a fish in 87 days, which is terrible in a little poor fisherman village. He's being kept alive by a boy who inexplicably still believes in him. Um, the little boy is keeping him alive, stealing food, bringing him food, little coffees every now and then. So Santiago one day goes out on the sea, thinking that, you know, it may be another failure like it's been many times before, but this time he actually snags a fish. And this fish is huge, right? So this fish drags Santiago for three days. And during these three days, it's just him on this little skill by himself and his hands are bleeding, his hands cramped, he's an old man. Um, his, and he just goes through so much pain and so much torment, he has to constantly like remind himself to like clear his head because things will get foggy after two or three days on the ocean being dragged by this huge marlin. Eventually, the fish comes up, and like I said, it's a giant fish, it's 1,500 pounds to you Australians, I think that's around 700 kgs. Um, <laughs> Is bigger than his boat. So Santiago sees the opportunity, uh, harpoons him, kills him. He's elated about it. You know, he gets the fish strapped to the side of the boat because the fish is actually bigger than the boat. The fish can't fit on the boat. So he had to strap it to the side of the boat and he starts sailing back home. He's thinking about all these things he's going to get without his meat and all this thing. And now he's back on top on the fisherman village just to because fish, so his whole life, everything that he's done is kind of validated by this moment, you know? He was feeling like a loser before. Um, but when he killed the fish, he used a harpoon, as I said. So harpoons draw blood, and blood draws sharks. And the first shark that comes for the fish, Santiago is ready for him, right? He cuts through the, he sees the big fin cutting through the water, it's a mako shark, the biggest one Santiago's ever seen, and Santiago has seen a lot of fish. So he, this is a big shark. Santiago uses the same harpoon, kills that fish. You know, he's thinking, okay, I think the bad time is coming. Two more fish come, he kills one. One of them takes his harpoon. So he's down to a knife, which he tapes to one of the oars. Um, eventually more sharks come, he loses his knife. As the sun sets and he's way, and he's like very far out, um, around 60 pounds of missing from the fish, he's, it's hard for me to even look at it now. He feels apologetic for killing the fish for going out so long. Um, then he, as it's getting dark, and he knows, you know, this is over. There's going to be dozens of sharks. And he says, I'm too old to club sharks to death. I'm an old man. I, I always got now as a little club. And he does, though. He, he, I mean, 
the, the sharks do come, they do take every bit of the fish, but he fights. He fights the whole night when no one's around, no one can see. He could have easily just sat there and just given up. And it was in this moment where I felt like he really epitomized what I needed. I thought to myself, I need that resolve. I need the ability to kind of play my part even when my head is cut off. I need, I want to be like Santiago. I want to be deathless. I want to be um, undefeated in destruction. I think that's the essence of stoicism. And Santiago is one of the most epic stoic characters in literature. So to illustrate this, I'll quickly break down the symbolism, which were the main players in this book. First, we have the sea. The sea is chaos. The sea is the world. The sea gives and takes indifferently. The sea is an unbiased and, and impartial, right? Uh, there's a quote in the book that says, Take, he has a bird rest on Santiago's boat, a little bird. And Santiago feels sad that, you know, birds are so frail and the sea is so wide and so strong and so powerful. He says, take a rest, little bird. Then go out and take your chance, like any man, bird, or fish. To the sea, they're all equal. Right. Then we have the fish. The fish is obvious. The fish is fortune. The fish is external success, validation, and wealth. It's all that we may want, all that we may desire for outside of ourselves, outside of those things that we can bring into our own lives. And then last, we have the sharks. Well, not last, but this last. We have the sharks. The sharks are a momentum more. The sharks are old age. The sharks are death. The sharks are inevitable. The sharks are going to take every single bit of everything you have, and there's nothing you're going to do about it. Um, so that's that's those three players. So finally, we have the old man. So the old man was me. The old man was you. The old man is us. Um, his first physical description, the Hemingway describes him as, everything about him was old, except his eyes. They were the color of the sea. They were cheerful and undefeated. That's very, that's very relevant. Um, there's numerous mission, there's numerous mentions of Santiago living in accordance to nature, um, courage, his temperance, the stoic virtues, his lack of ego. It runs rampant throughout this book. Like Lynn said, I could take out a lot and just post them around because there's the all through this book. Um, I'll read you out a few, a few quotes. After he said during the days when he thought that he might die actually from the fish, he said, I love and respect you very much, but I will kill you dead before the day ends. So even though he does love and respect the fish, he understands their roles in nature. And he understands that even though he loves and respects this fish, this fish has to die or else he was going to die. You know, he's going to starve to death. He can't even feel himself. Um, clear your head and learn to suffer like a man or a fish, he tells himself. Um, Santiago saw the virtue of suffering. He saw the virtue of suffering being redemptive for himself. Um, he said, a pain does, a pain does, and pain does not matter to a man. To Santiago, the only, only duty, only purpose, only virtue and willingness to suffer made him worthy to kill this beautiful and magical fish. He said to himself while he was contemplating, I'm glad, I th I'm glad that men do not have to kill the stars. So even though he's this little man who barely managed to kill a, to kill a fish on a boat, if it were said to him, he would go up to the heavens and he would kill the stars because he felt like anything that was thrust upon him is duty. Even though the stars are beautiful and we need them, this, you know, the, it would be terrible to kill him, as he said, but he would do that and he would accept that. And that was one of the things that I didn't know about him too. Santiago does not differentiate between which side of the rod that he's on. So for him, being the fish in the water or being the man on the boat were around the same thing. The fish had youth, the fish had strength, the fish had size, the, the fish had freedom. The man was limited, he had the little boat, but Santiago would switch places with him. He said it a few times during this thing. Um, he said another one. 
how it's kill each other. Fish is killing me, same as I'm I'm killing you. That's what he paraphrased to the fish. Um, and finally, this was the one, and this is the one that like obviously makes this book stand out for me. Man was not made for defeat. A man may be destroyed, but not defeated. I heard this echo before by Captain Ahab as he was getting pulled down into the water by Moby Dick, knowing that he's going to die. He said, from the depths of hell, I strike it thee. With my last breath, I spit it thee. Thou all destroying, yet unconquering whale. So even though this whale can destroy everything, this whale lacks the ability to conquer him. Because defeat and being conquered is a choice. Stoicism teaches us that that choice is always up to us. The world may take, time may take, things may take from us, it may break us, it will destroy us eventually. No one makes out this alive, I hate to tell you. Um, <laughs> but being de defeated, that's the thing that, you know, you, you just can't do. And that's the thing that I really want to avoid doing myself. Um, submission to the Submission to the inevitable destruction, yet the fortitude of undefeatable will is the essence of stoicism for me. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, as I said, defeat is an option. Defeat requires submission, seeking outside yourself. To me, a true story like Santiago may be destroyed, will be destroyed, just like we're all going to be destroyed, but he would never ever be defeated. All right. Tough act to solo. Thanks, guys. Both of you. That was amazing. It's really good. Um, right. So let me just start um, get my talk up on the phone. I'm going to talk about a book by Ed Spence, um, uh, which is um, about stoicism and AI, which is something I hadn't thought about. Okay, um, and the book is called um, Stoic Philosophy and the control problem of AI technology. So as modern stoicism grows, new possibilities emerge. Stoicism's credentials are, are, are clear, I think, um, by virtue of its very popularity in terms of what it can um, do in terms of helping individuals. Um, but can stoic principles help us address the challenges posed to us collectively in the 21st century? with the advent of monopolistic information and communications uh, technologies and, and uh, monopolistic companies like Facebook, Twitter and Google, as well as the continuing uh, developments of AI, artificial intelligence. So this is, this is a challenge, right? That's the question that Ed Spence asks. He contends, I think, with some um, force that um, collectively these are amongst the biggest things we have to face. So if you're familiar with Shoshana Zuboff's book, Surveillance Capitalism, Ed Spencer's Stoic Philosophy and the Control Problem of AI Tech, um, full title, Caught in the Web, which came out last year. Um, it's, it's a book which addresses similar subject matter. Um, as we've been learning since at least 2014, when awareness began to catch on about how governments, private and partisan interests can use social media to rapidly spread mass Miss and disinformation learn a lot more since. Increasing reliance of more and more people on social media platforms like Facebook to get their news and views raises what um, Ed calls profound issues of privacy, transparency, accountability, opacity, truth, trust, as well as about the corruption of information. So this is heavy stuff. The prospect of researching machine learning and AI, meanwhile, will lead at some point in most of our lifetimes it's predicted to super intelligent AI agents, raises even more profound anxieties, if that were possible. Some commentators, including Ed Spence, worry that these machines may in fact 
proved to pose existential risks to humanity, which would make Mary Shelley's Frankenstein look really tame. The Matrix is more like what some commentators are worrying about. Spencer's book is organised around a question which he takes from ancient philosophy, which is really what good is technology? Especially, as he says, in cases where the eudaimonic impact of a particular <laughs> tech in society is not only very negligible, approaching zero, but maybe negative and harmful. For Spence, we should be thinking about the technologies we create or those which as societies we are allowing to be created, patented and commercialised. We should do this, um, referring to Stoicism along three axes, which he thinks are central, I think he's right, to the older idea of wisdom that we've been talking about, um, wisdom as against mere knowledge. So firstly, um, a consideration of these te technologies from the perspective of wisdom would, would look at their potential e impacts at the level of what he calls um, the epistemic impact. So this is um, considering what do these texts mean for the so soci um, socially available knowledge out there? And in democracies, how do they affect the quality of public debate? What effects do ICT platforms and search engines have on the quality of the information available to us as citizens? as well as to our capacities to analyse, criticise and certify claims by different agents. Also, can ordinary citizens come to even know about how the information they share on these sites is being stored, used, harvested and sold, as well as to whom, for what ends? Um, good questions. Secondly, there are specifically ethically, uh, specifically ethical concerns that it takes up surrounding the ICTs. And this is basically, can these technologies actually be used to harm people? And the answer that Ed gives is probably the answer that you're all thinking in your head. Thirdly, there is the eudaimonistic concern for social and individual wellbeing, as well as just collective safety. How does the availability of these texts and the increasing unavoidability of social media in our daily and working lives affect people's happiness. Basically, do they make us better people um, necessarily, or even um, according to what, what we can learn from statistics and the like, um, you know, even, even um, uh, in that sense, can, can, can they and uh, do they uh, affect people's happiness positively? More social media use, does it make more people happy? Again, the data is, is not encouraging. This relates to what using a, a term which links directly to the Stoics, Spence calls the control problem surrounding ICT and AI. Stoicism, as we know, asks us to pay great attention to what we can control and what we can't. We've heard a lot about this. Um, the classic formulation comes from Epictetus, the handbook. Um, open it up, there it is. <coughs> so it asks, who controls our ICT? And who could control AI? if it soon comes to take on more than human, even perhaps purposive intelligence? Crazy questions, but it seems as though this is emerging as a, as a prospect. Should Stoics <coughs> just treat the big tech companies as indifferent? Because after all, they're not very transparent and they're beyond the control of 99.9% .9 of human beings. Ed's answer is a forthright no. For these companies are now so ubiquitous, so monopolistic, and so unavoidable that they, wrote, they pose a risk to our social well-being. This is Ed's argument. Stoics are eudaimonists, that is, they, they're interested in human flourishing and the pursuit of wisdom. So Ed argues that, quote, precisely because of the potential harmful impacts these texts can have on the epistemic, ethical, and eudaimonic aspects of our lives, we should in fact endeavour to bring them under human social control. That's his claim, easier said, of course, than done. You can talk about it. Yes, someone's going to say, but surely Stoics have the capacity, as Stoics, we have the capacity to choose not to use Facebook, not to use Google, not to use Twitter. And anyway, they can hardly take away our autonomy. Not even Zeus can take that away, the Stoics say. Spencer's key argument is that there is a basic contradiction between Facebook's business model and its media role. As a business, Facebook is actuated and directed by two things. First, a financial interest in keeping people on its site. This by feeding users information which confirms their biases, including political biases, titillating or entertaining them. Two, Facebook is actuated by its being the custodian and owner of the information that we give to the site 
and which they then commodify and package and sell to advertisers. This is what Zuboff calls behavioural surplus. Now, given the number of users it commands and the numbers of people who use Facebook to access news, Spence argues that it should be held to the same normative standards of accountability that newspapers, televisual and other media companies are held to. Facebook should ensure, as far as Spence is concerned, the basic truthfulness, accuracy, reliability and trustworthiness of what's on its platform. The problem, as we all know, is that having such a commitment would potentially seriously crash Facebook's bottom line. Facebook wants your eyeballs on its page and thus on its clients' ads. These advertisers want the information Facebook feeds you to play to your preferences based on your previous interactions with the media so you stay on the site longer looking at more of their ads. Now, if this means feeding you junk information, fake news, alternative facts, or propaganda, frankly, issued by agents unknown from the, the angle of their business bottom line, so be it. But of course, as a voter, as a citizen, as a person, your autonomous choices will necessarily be limited by the knowledge that you have of what is happening in the world. You can only freely choose to be for and against something, for example, if you know what it is. Um, this is something that John Locke, um, a philosopher, was quite strong on. Hence, to the extent that you are not free to choose or even learn about which information is being fed to you by your social media on the basis of their algorithms, Spence claims, and I think it's a controversial claim that we can discuss, that our agency is diminished, our capacity to be to the fullest um, autonomous versions of ourselves. Then there is, of course, the issue of privacy due to the behavioural surplus these platforms are able to glean from our likes and shares, our posts and comments, our social networks and friends. The amounts of time we spend reading which articles, even our keystrokes, all of this can be harvested and sold <coughs> as profiling information to third parties. Now, freedom of communication from surveillance was long recognised as a basic liberal right. You can read articles about it in political science journals as recent as the 1950s as a defining feature of political democracies as against the others. With the advent of the ICT, Spencer's book reminds us that we've simply lost or given up a right which previous generations deemed fundamental to any free society, all with very little protest. As Spence cites Carissa Velez's Privacy is Power, quote, Surveillance threatens freedom, equality, democracy, autonomy, creativity, and intimacy. That's a troubling list. Spencer's book details in reference to the latest literature on this subject how there is nothing transparent about the filtering algorithms which these ICT platforms use to map who you are, what your interests are, what you will like or be outraged by, because outrage engages. And so what should show up on your phone as you do your first scroll down before you get out of bed? most mornings. Indeed, because of the complexity of the machine learning technology, this is where it gets really mind-bending, because of the complexity of the machine learning tech that these algorithms reflect, there is a real question as to whether anybody, anybody, even if they had the will, whether concerned national governments or even the companies themselves will soon be able to monitor what these algorithms are doing. So Spence um, is using an article here called The Ethics of Algorithms. Mapping the Debate by Mittel Start et al. The Ethics of Algorithms Mapping the Debate, um, which I think is, is really um, worthwhile to read. Um, meaningful oversight and human intervention in algorithmic dis, um, decision making, this article writes, is impossible when the machine has an information advantage over its operator, or when the machine cannot be controlled in real time by a human because its processing speed and the multi multitude of operational variables. This is what we call the black box problem, creating black boxes. It is these same considerations which Spence argues, I think, persuasively make the need for public accountability and debate surrounding the rapid developments of AI so urgent. Put simply, the technologies we're creating threat to become un unmanageable by humans in real time. This, not simply by any government who might have the concerns, but even by the companies who are eagerly developing these technologies playing with creating toys whose capabilities could soon affect nearly everybody whilst being betrothed to nothing greater than their own shareholder value. If that's not a troubling prospect, Spence argues, then it might be hard to imagine what is. So Spence's book, I think, is a book which addresses concerns which are very public. Um, I really encourage people to explore it. Um, I learned it a good deal. I didn't find it comfortable to, to read all of this, but I think this stuff is real, so therefore it needs to be addressed. 
couple of closing considerations. I would argue, and um, I'd be fascinated to hear what Ed might say about this, that I, I felt that the, the stoic dimension of the ethics that, you know, you don't need to be stoic to be concerned about this stuff. Ed, Ed um, presents stoic arguments um, against these technologies and some of these traveling prospects, fair enough. Um, but perhaps it's the strength of the book that in fact, I think you don't need to be um, doctrinally in any particular school. Um, some basic commitment to cosmopolitanism, democracy, wisdom, and human dignity will get you across the line. Secondly, Ed's book, he comes from a certain kind of philosophical background, and he does have a tendency to go for acronyms. So here's an example, TGLAT, T-G-L-A-T, Theory of the Good Life and Technology. I would have just gone with Theory of the Good Life. What about CCT-GL, Contributive Capability of Technology for a Good Life? I'm not one for irony, but that looks a little tech. Anyway, this is a professional stylistic tick, distinct to scholars who work in a certain philosophical tradition and social scientific traditions. It takes some getting used to if you get the book, but persist because obviously um, the, the, the subject matter and the considerations of the book are so, so important. I, I really hope for Ed's sake um, that, that non academic readers aren't turned away. Um, so, yeah. Spencer's project has taken stoicism off road to address these, these questions. I, I really want to commend. Um, I think it's a timely book, and hopefully, it's going to be the first of many as, as stoicism begins to grow and it becomes more than just um, what it already is, which is, of course, its heart, which is an individual ethics, but also a philosophy that can address some of the larger issues that we all face. So, thank you very much. That's it.